In podcasting and covering success stories, you sometimes come across a topic that, hmm, you don't know how to deal with it. And this is one of them. I had a little bit of trouble wrapping my brain around this interview. And I just want to warn you that one of the topics we're talking about today is suicide. I had an opportunity to talk to Beth and Robin from the Wellness Wednesday episodes on blind abilities, and I was ready. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to meet and talk to our guest today, Zach Tidwell. Shot myself between the eyes with my concealed carry firearm, and that's what actually took my sight. I've established as, as normal as a life as, as a blind person can since then. I own my own business. Obviously, we just talked about now I'm a successful app developer. I do public speaking. I'm writing a book. Everyone is unique to how they approach sudden blindness. And Zach Tidwell has a driving force that is second to none. I started researching and once I found out it was code, and I, I had never written a line of code in my life. I decided I was going to be part of the solution, and so I started teaching myself. And without further ado, please welcome Zach Tidwell. And just realize that just because you don't know other people with disabilities doing some of these things, or you don't think that it's possible, you can step outside of, of that box that you've built for yourself or that society may have built for you and try it and sometimes you're going to fall on your face but when you don't and even when you do you learn a lot but when you don't i mean you're moving the bar higher for everyone then you can start to share that knowledge with people and doing that and helping bring others along with you is very very fulfilling i have my website at zachtidwell.net and darkhorsegamestudios.com Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. Today in the studio, we have Zach Tidwell, and he's a game developer that came out with a game, an award-winning game, Xanagrams. Zach, welcome to Blind Abilities. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Hey, it's been a while. You sent out a message to me about three months ago, and I've been putting it off, putting it off. And after I listened to your podcast that you've been on around the... Around the nation, really, I got interested, and we just released a Wellness Wednesday that talks about mental illness, and I knew you are going to be on the show, so thanks for taking the time to come on to Blind Abilities. I'm glad we were finally able to get a time locked down. It took us a minute, but hopefully this will turn out great. Well, I wanted both of us to listen to your previous podcast so we could improve upon them. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Xanagrams. You're blind and you coded the game and you won an award that really marks your place in the blindness games. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. So I, I lost my sight five years ago. And then after I went back to college, I was, you know, after I learned how to use screen readers and stuff like that, I came across some inaccessible classes. Obviously, I'd seen inaccessible websites and stuff like that before, but I was in a statistics class and nothing about the class was accessible. So the school just assigned me someone to be my eyeballs for everything. And I got tired of that really quickly. And after my first exam... We, I actually ended up started researching why some things were accessible with readers and why others weren't. And when I found out it all came down to the code of each app or website, I dropped out of college to teach myself how to code. And less than two years later, I had my own company and St. the Grams hit the App Store. And about five months after that, it won Game of the Year on Apple Biz. So it's been a while, but you know, I feel like I have a new purpose now and a, a new passion as well, which is really important. So your frustration with inaccessibility led you to dig in. Yeah, I started researching and once I found out it was code and I, I had never written a line of code in my life, but I decided I was going to be part of the solution. And so I started teaching myself. I Googled initially, I had only learned how to use JAWS on Windows. So I, I found a tool that I, I reached out to some different schools for the blind and I found one that was teaching robotics to their students. And so I, I asked what tools they were using. I spent nine months learning that programming language and using that tool. And then I found out when it came down to trying to get my app on an iPhone, it was inaccessible. And so I stepped back, found out that I was going to have to develop on a Mac to, to make apps for the iPhone. And so I actually used JAWS alongside my Mac. I would look up voiceover articles on my Windows computer, read them, and then 
practice actually, you know, moving around through Finder and things like that on my Mac. And once I had basic skills on that, I started teaching myself Apple's programming language, Swift. And a little over a year after that is when Xanagrams was finally ready for its first release. But I treated it as a full-time job. If I wasn't out of town on a ski trip or rock climbing trip or whitewater kayaking, you know, I was at home working when I wasn't in the gym. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like time pressed and sortie quest i talked to those developers they've been on here as well as circus masters revenge with joke work but learning code and swift from what i understand they have accessibility features built in there that you can utilize whereas some codes you'd have to just incorporate them in where in swift is it like a checkbox or something of that nature so when you write code, there's a code itself that runs all of the programs and there's different frameworks for developing the front end. So all the, the visuals and stuff like the, the on-screen elements and then Swift UI is that framework. And so it's, it extends the functionality of the language essentially so that you can do all of the interfaces and it doesn't do all of the accessibility for you. You still have to choose to implement it. But the option is there. And so that's like Xanagrams works with refreshable Braille displays or even with voice control for people who have had upper limb amputations or just motor impairments. You know, mm -hmm. they can use it with their voice. And that's all. I just put the time in to research those additional features and implement them. But so many developers don't do it because it is it's a little extra work. And especially to, to polish it, it is. But yeah, the scaffolding is kind of there. Why don't you give the listeners a description of Xanagrams? Xanagrams, it's a word puzzle game, but it combines trivia with, with anagrams. And so if you don't know what an anagram is, a traditional anagram would be some sort of sentence or sentence fragment that gives you a clue, and then there would be a one-word answer for it. So the anagram might be the, a bird's equivalent of hair, and the answer might be feather. Uh, and then all of the letters for feather would be mixed in with a bunch of random letters and you would basically try and de-scramble those letters to find the word feather. The way Xanagrams works is every puzzle and these puzzles, half of them are themed and half of them aren't. You know, I've written, I think, over 1,300 anagrams at this point. So there's a lot to the game, but they come in these puzzle packs that might be themed. And so they might cover anything from true crime to history to technology and hobbies and things like that. Or they could be unthemed, but those ones are a little bit harder because you have no context when you get into the actual puzzle. Puzzle. Each puzzle has six anagram clues, and at the end of each clue, it tells you how many letters are in the answer for that anagram. And then in the bottom portion of the screen, each of those six answers has been broken up into groups of two or three letters, and they present as buttons. And so, you know, if your answer was feather, you might see a button that says FE, and then another one that says ATH, and another one that says ER. But those three groups of letters are also going to be mixed in from the letter groups of the other five answers in that puzzle. And so by the time that you finish each puzzle, you use every one of those letter groups once. And Xanagrams automatically detects when you've spelled one of those words right. When you do, it disables those buttons permanently and it hides them from voiceover. Mm -hmm. Visually, they still present on screen and they're just crossed out and dimmed, but it allows you to use the process of elimination to work through these puzzles. And it, it creates an interesting... It, it puts you in a, in a weird place. I call it a quandary because... Yeah. <laughs> I might use the H-E-R in another one, and then all of a sudden I see I could use it down here, and it's better suited there, so it's like, oops. <laughs> yeah, it's you have to be very mindful as you're completing the puzzles, and that's where it does get challenging, and that was intentional, but people must be enjoying it if it won the <laughs> game of the year on Apple Biz. So it's it's been cool to yeah. get that, that feedback from the community. Well, I went through a few of them, you know, as getting, but they, they start to get a little bit tougher. You're right. It's a mind game because you got to think of the word and you, you think you got the word. You even can use your smart devices trying to come up with the word, but you're limited to the letters down below. So then the game is on, you know, it's like mind over matter here. You're just, it's addicting. Yeah. And you really, you end up having to piece things together like a real puzzle. It's, I haven't found any other games like it. It seems to be pretty unique a unique approach to something that's you know a relatively common type of word puzzle but yeah it's it's doing well right now so that feels really good 
do you carry a tape recorder around with you when all of a sudden you think of another Xanagram idea? <laughs> no, it's actually because I do everything in packs. You might have noticed when you download the game, you get two puzzle packs for free. So mm -hmm. every puzzle pack has 10 Xanagrams in it. Each Xanagram has six individual anagrams in it. So you get 120 free anagrams to play. And one of those packs is themed and the other isn't. So when I make those themed packs, you know, by the time I get 30 anagrams into like the ancient history puzzle pack that, mm -hmm. that's in the store, by the time you're halfway through that, I realize, like, okay, I've exhausted my knowledge of ancient history in the sense of questions that can have a really short clue and only a one word answer. And so it becomes hours of work on the last half of those puzzle packs. And I just, I have to force myself to sit down and do it because it does get pretty tedious. Yeah, I was wondering where it all came from, how you do it, but it, but it's really interesting. So I encourage people, they can get it on the App Store, iOS, right? Yep, iPad and iOS, it's free to download. And every puzzle that you play, the game has live leaderboards so you can compete against your friends and the rest of the world. And also, it's infinitely replayable because the first time that you play each Xanagram, you're seeing the exact same version of that puzzle that everyone else in the world sees. And so the game scores you competitively and you get your score. But then if you want to come back to that puzzle later, Xanagrams randomizes how all the words are broken up. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be completely different than the first time you played it. And you know, if you play through a puzzle pack and come back to it a month later, you're not going to remember most of the questions and it's like replaying it all over again. And so when you have those two entire puzzle packs for free, you'll be shocked how much time it takes you to get through. You got a groundhog's day yeah. <laughs> built into yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so you won't run out of something to do. It's just great how you started your own company and you got some success with your first game out. So good for you. You've mentioned earlier that you've been adventurous, athletic. You know, you do some hiking, kayaking, working out. And I know you've raced motorcycle at the track. And that's where you occurred some head trauma, which led you down a path of mental illness and well-being, which ultimately led you to attempt to take your own life. Why don't you fill us in on this journey that you've been on? Yeah, so there's a lot to it. So if I get too into the weeds, just stop me and I'll try and reel it in. I will try and be concise as possible here. But I was in the Marines. I was a machine gunner in the Marine Corps and stationed in Southern California and deployed twice but did not see combat. On my second deployment, I had found out that my wife was cheating on me. And when I got back, you know, we tried to make it work, but it didn't. And about a month after I filed for divorce in March of 2018, I was in a really, really bad motorcycle accident out at a racetrack that I used to go ride at. I was intentionally keeping myself as busy as possible, just as a means of, of not giving my mind too much time to dwell on on what was going on. I wasn't in the best place I'd ever been, but I was doing all right. As much as you can be when going through a divorce like that and after that being the impetus for the end of the marriage. But I don't remember probably an eight hour period of that day. I remember riding out at the racetrack and I have a vague memory of picking my dirt bike up off the backside of a jump, but that's about it. Everything else that I know has been filled in from friends and family. and. Mm -hmm. I made it back to my truck and I had concussions in the past from sports growing up. I, I am and always have been very active. So I, I knew that feeling of the difference between getting your bell rung and there actually being something wrong. And I knew something was wrong. So I called my parents who lived 17 hours away in Colorado. So I still don't know why I called them and not someone from my platoon, but called them and was like, hey, I was in a motorcycle accident and I'm pretty sure I have a concussion. And like, where are you? And I didn't know. So they had me go talk to someone that was nearby. I wasn't with anyone that I knew, but it was a racetrack. So there were a ton of people there. And went and talked to the guy. He told them where I was at. When I got the phone back, they said, all right, give us a few minutes. We're going to get a hold of some of your buddies and get them down to, to get you out of there and get your stuff. Because obviously you shouldn't be driving after something like that. I guess right after they hung up, I called them back and said the same thing that I had just said. Like, hey, I, I was in a really bad motorcycle accident. I think I had a concussion. And eventually they got a hold of my buddies. But that's they knew something was seriously wrong at that point. And... 
my friends picked me up and took me to the hospital. I had a severe traumatic brain injury. And later that night, we all went out to dinner before we went back to base. First thing I remember is being at dinner that night after that, that vague memory of picking my dirt bike up. So I think it was really muddy that day. And I think when I came down on the backside of the jump, my bike just slid out from underneath me. And from looking at my helmet, it looks like I just went straight to like the upper left quadrant of the top of my head. The helmet was annihilated on, on that part of the helmet. But oh, wow. I ended up really kind of turning downhill after that. I became very agitated and impulsive. I really started having trouble sleeping and I started taking the alcohol. I don't know why those are all pretty common things for for serious head injuries but then i started to really spiral with depression in august of that same year i was honorably discharged from the marine corps because my contract was over and i moved to colorado to start going to school and working i did that through through the end of 2018 and in march of 2019 i so we're actually about to come up on the five-year anniversary the 31st will be five years but I shot myself in the head. I just, I didn't want to be here anymore. And I shot myself between the eyes with my concealed carry firearm. And that's what actually took my sight. So I'm completely blind. I'm deaf in one ear, no sense of smell and some other things, but those are the big ones that affect me. But you know, day to day, but I've established as, as normal as a life as, as a blind person can since then. I own my own business. Obviously, we just talked about now I'm a successful app developer. I do public speaking. I'm writing a book about everything that happened, you know, in terms of my poor decisions that led to my suicide attempt and everything that I've done to get through the things since waking up after being taken off life support, completely blind and deaf in one ear. And I ski and I whitewater kayak and I rock climb and I skydive. And three weeks ago now, I just competed in my third Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournament against people without any disabilities. I'll be out in California surfing next week. This organization that I'm going to has never worked with a totally blind guy, but we're going to see if it's possible. We're going to figure it out. It's been a long journey, but that's <laughs> trying to be as concise as possible. That's where I've I've gone in the past five years. Where where do you find the zest, the vigor to take on all these challenges? You, I mean, you got a new look on life. It seems like uh, I don't mean that by pun with the vision and all that stuff. I mean, you have a new outlook, I should say, on life and taking on challenges. I mean, coding is something. It's not for everyone. White water rafting, surfing mountain climbing, everything like that you're doing are pretty huge challenges. Where do you find that in you to do those activities? That didn't come for free. I was in a really bad spot when I woke up or when they took me off life support. But eight and a half months later, I was in the Rocky Mountains trying to snowboard again because I did that when I could see. And I just, I when I was in the hospital and got transferred to the VA, once I was stable, I, I met a blind rehab professional. She asked me what I like to do. I told her everything that I did before I could see. I was like, you know, I ride motocross, I downhill mountain bike, I lift weights, I do all these things. And she told me that I would be able to do everything if I wanted to other than the motorcycles. And so I immediately latched onto that and was like, that is what I'm going to get back to. Like I said, eight and a half months later, I was on the mountain. I didn't know how to cook for myself or anything at that point, but I wanted to see if I could do it. And that's been something that's, I've always been big on pushing myself in whatever way possible, whether it's mentally or physically. I like that growth that comes with it. And so I picked that back up. You know, I had the lapse in judgment when I shot myself, but it didn't have to be the end of it. And I saw that I could have a normal life. And so I went after it. So I had the snowboarding trip a month after that, I was back in college. Six months after that, I was back out on my own. And then six months after that, I bought my first house and it's just been continual. I seek out these challenges and, and like to, to figure out if I can do it or not. Most of the time, whether it's, you know, I didn't know any blind people that did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I just started calling gyms and seeing if anyone was willing to work with me. And three years later, I've, it's something that I, I love and I look forward to doing. Uh, and I compete and do well. And that's even with the book. The book's a new challenge. Coding was a new challenge. But I, I think not only along the way as I was having to relearn how to do the most basic things like brush my teeth or feed myself or cook for myself again, I was still getting a sense of independence from these other things. And that showed me that life didn't have to be over. 
after that. It could be if I let it be, but I, I chose to not let it be. And so really those all kind of led me into this funnel of which, which kind of the focal point, at least for now, was getting Xanagrams out there and getting the community feedback that it's gotten, that it is helping people. You know, I I had to reestablish my identity. I had lost it. I was I was a machine gunner in the Marines, then I got out and was a veteran, but was going to school and wanted to be an ER nurse, but I couldn't do that anymore. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. But all of those things kind of built upon each other and led me in that direction. And now I feel, you know, I, I've gotten sober now since Xanagrams has come out. And it's all these things really, especially as I write the book and am having to reflect on these things individually. Mm-hmm. That's what I've realized is I didn't feel, once I had accomplished that, I did not feel like the the blindness wasn't my identity or, or not being able to do some of these things wasn't my identity. It was, okay, I, I've accomplished something. I'm putting something into the world that's helping other people. And that's ultimately what I wanted to do after I got out of the Marines as a nurse. And so I, I feel like more than just the disability now. And I feel that because I've been through all of this, that I, I'm finally kind of qualified to try and help others overcome this stuff and just realize that just because you don't know other people, other people with disabilities doing some of these things, or you don't think that it's possible, you can step outside of of that box that you've built for yourself or that society may have built for you and try it. And sometimes you're going to fall on your face, but when you don't, and even when you do, you learn a lot, but when you don't, I mean, you're moving the bar higher for everyone. Then you can start to share that knowledge with people and doing that and helping bring others along with you is very, very fulfilling. And it's genuine. And I think not everyone finds a passion like I I have with coding or with these other things that I'm doing and have to work a more typical job. But I I think really trying to give back like this might be incredibly healing for some people and help them through their own grief. Yeah. Zach, I think it's remarkable how you've adjusted to your blindness because typically it takes people quite a long time before they mm, get back on a path of acceptance and moving forward. And yet here you're on quite an accelerated timeline of successes. Where did this all start? What set everything in motion? So after I shot myself, they actually took me to a private facility and they had no idea how to deal with a blind guy. They also didn't know that I was going to be totally blind. They thought after I had my facial reconstruction that I was going to get some sight back. So they didn't know about voiceover on an iPhone. I had an iPhone, but you know, while I sat in that hospital for the first month while I stabilized, they didn't show me any of that because they didn't know it was possible. So they gave me a Swiffer mop handle with a tennis ball on the end of it and showed me how to shoreline my way around rooms or hallways when someone was with me. So that conversation when I got transferred to the VA was during my intake process. So they got me over there and weighed me and took all my vitals and did that stuff. And then that woman, her name was was Pam, immediately followed along with the nurses getting and doctors getting the stuff taken care of that they needed to get taken care of immediately. And that conversation, you know, she, along with telling me that I could get back to all of those things, should I choose to, she told me, hey, when you're out of here, uh, we'll be able to send you to blind rehab. You're going to learn how to do all of these things. There's people like me that have master's degrees in blind rehab and you will essentially go to school to learn how to be independent again. And that was like a a saving grace kind of because I thought I was going to have to live in a nursing home or with my parents for the rest of my life. And I went to blind rehab for two and a half months and I still thought, you know, as I left there, because I had the basics of all these skills, but I was not independent. They introduced me to the the foundational skills and that's about as far as I got. And when I came home, I, I practiced all of those things every day while I lived with my parents. But again... The technology was a big one and just realizing how independent you can be with a cane. I didn't believe it as they were telling me these things, especially because I am deaf in one ear and I was adjusting to that in addition to having no light perception anymore. That was kind of the biggest hiccup for me with with cane navigation. But they told me, you know, eventually you'll be able, you could get to the point where you could even orient yourself to new places outdoors by yourself. Again, it was like that was the light at the end of the tunnel on that avenue of being blind. And living alone was another one. Getting back into college was another one. I realized that I wasn't shut out from all these things. 
which is, it's kind of wild to think I had never met another blind person before I was blind. It's not that common. And so your perception of it is like the old timey, like Disney movies where it's a blind person begging on the side of the street. And that's so not true. That was Mr. Magoo. Yes. It was so just uplifting to realize like, Hey, yeah, I'll, I, I have no problem putting in the work, but that is possible. That was actually big, you know, especially through these, the ski trips and stuff that I go on. And that first one, especially being around other blind people that aren't just. You're not alone. Yeah, but they were choosing to go out and do these things and not just sit in their woes about it. All of these guys had had sight and most of them had lost them in traumatic ways. And yet they were here and they'd all been there in that place a lot longer than I had. So it was also seeing the other things that they were doing back home and how independent they were was also huge. So the combination of those two things, just being informed and then seeing people actually get after it were just, I I mean, they, the value, they they were invaluable experiences Mm -hmm. and, and exposures. When I first lost my eyesight, some of it, I went to a school and took a tour And I remember getting back into the car with my mom and just saying, no way. It's all weird in there. You know, it's something of that nature. (laughs) I I don't know what I said. It it was just odd. But they gave me a Braille card, A through Z and 1 through 10, you know. Uh And they called me up like three and a half months later and said, you can start part time. Okay. So I went down there. Two weeks after I was there, they were some of the neatest people I've ever met in my life. (laughs) Because they had, like you said, they had already lost They've experienced it. They were just trying to get some skills because they're moving in the directions that I thought I didn't have directions. I didn't, it gave me hope that, wow. And then when they turned on that computer and a voice was talking, it was like, oh, wow. Yeah. Back, I can, I can use this. <laughs> and I just dug in. And you mentioned the word passion. Oh, I dug in, you know, just, and then you could go to college. I can go to college. Yeah, you can make a living like a normal human being. (laughs) Yeah, it's so empowering. Mm -hmm. Meeting others. Yeah. That have conditions that are similar to yours and they're thriving. And that's the big part is they are choosing not to let that define them or to be defeated by it. I think that is the important aspect of that. Like they've been where you are and yet here they are now. It's it's important. I mean, they're role models. And I said, whether you you probably don't, I don't think I recognized it at the time, but I mean, they do become role models. Yeah. One of them, Kevin, he's passed away. Um, He came over one time. He said, well, what do you want to do today? He came down, he traveled down to the cities. He was staying at my place for three, four days. And he says, what do you want to do today? Well, I'd like to return this and I want to do that, but I don't want to take a taxi and all that stuff. And he said, well, let's just get it done. And he flipped for the taxi and brought me to three different places and all this other stuff. And the day was filled with accomplishments. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, if you have a desire to do something, you just do it. However you have to do it, you do it. You know. And I keep rem- thinking of that, that if you want to do something then do it. You know, can you do the do it? You know, that's the main thing. And it was as his, uh, his words still stick with me today that if I want to do something, well, Jeff, who's stopping you other than yourself? Yeah. Personally, I really struggled early on realizing how, I mean, everything takes longer and there's usually a couple extra steps added to it. And I struggled at first with accepting that. Mm Mm-hmm. Once you can move past that and just decide, yep, okay, like that is what it is. And like Kevin told you, it it does. And even I I would say in in spite of those additional steps and things, it does become more fulfilling just going out and getting normal things done after the fact. It might be more frustrating on the front end, but those wins really do add up. And I think one of the other things is you keep on, I keep on, I kept on, I should put this intense correctly. You're writing a book. You know all about that. I used to be always cognizant or thinking that I had to be cognizant what other people would think. And yet, if it takes me longer to do something and I do it and all this stuff, who really cares when I don't even see most of the people for two weeks from now? Yeah. They don't know what it took me to get to this point. I teach woodworking, but I'm sitting at a desk I made from scratch and people just look at it and go, oh, that's really cool. You did that? Yeah, that's nice. You know, But there might be 300 mistakes that I made before I could do this. Yes. I never talk about those, but I remember them. 
Yeah, and, and when you're dealing with vision loss like that, those extra steps and failed attempts kind of apply to everything. Like everything becomes that and, and people don't realize it, but that's again, kind of coming back to just being around those people. I think that's why it has so much value, especially early on in recovery like that, just to realize that, okay, they've, they're sucking it up and they're, they are making it happen. Like Kevin, they're just doing it. You know, experience to me is your willingness to experience something is where you learn. Like you were talking about, you spent two and a half months there. They gave you the bits and pieces to think over and wonder if you're going to use them. And you didn't have confidence. But when you got home, you started applying them and experiencing them and growing. That's when it happens. Yeah. When you're actually experiencing it. Yes. And that's opening your yourself up to failures there. Like while I lived at, at home with my parents for that next seven months, I cooked every day and had my mom watch in the mornings to make sure I wasn't going to eat raw whatever it was that I was cooking. I made myself start using my computer every day. So I made a blog. I figured out how to create a WordPress site and started posting on there every day. Same kind of things to put myself in those scenarios. And like the blog never went anywhere. And a lot of the cooking was horrible, but you still learn through that. And I think in that sense, the vision loss is incredibly humbling too. I think that's part of the process really of, of coming to terms with it is it's another thing to accept, but just as important as everything else. Yeah, it's been a long process for me adjusting to the blindness, and it still is as my eyesight gets worse and worse, in a sense. I mean, someone that goes totally blind, it's a heavy load all at once, and yet I'm slowly being weaned into the acceptance of vision loss continually. Yeah. <laughs> still, amongst my blind friends, I'm the sighted guy, and amongst my sighted friends, I'm the blind guy. So it's kind of interesting. Always sitting on that fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've thought about that before. You know, I'm most of the blind people that I know are are other veterans, but it's still you get the whole range from you know traumatic events that led to immediate vision loss to guys who just with genetic disorders that are losing it. I feel like losing it suddenly might be easier than than losing it over time like that because I did. Yeah, it was a big adjustment up front, but I had to rely on it. And so I had to lean into learning those skills. It was emotionally handling that once. It was a prolonged period, but I'm not, my vision didn't stabilize for two years. And then I start to lose it more again. And that, I don't, that seems like it would be very, very tough emotionally and mentally. Yeah, I think anyone who goes through vision loss or blindness their journey is unique to them. Yeah. And yet, I always have a friend or someone that says, oh, I met a blind person before. I know all about them. <laughs> like, like we're all penguins on an iceberg and you go by on a boat and you just look, you just see penguins. You don't see individuality. <laughs> and yet, we know that we are not just another penguin amongst the bunch. We're all individuals. And yet, when we have a cane, it's like the scarlet letter B on our chest. They identify us as oh a blind guy yeah i thought blind meant you were totally blind i didn't realize visually impaired and low vision were that like even that has been eye-opening when i'm with other blind people usually there's more people on that spectrum of vision loss than at the end of the spectrum and I, that's i mean just socially I, people don't know that stuff mm -hmm. because it's really not that common to run into unless it's you might get it around people that are a little older more commonly but other than that you really just you don't experience it very often yeah like i said when i first lost some vision i asked the question to my counselor where do they keep the blind yeah. <laughs> and you may understand that because you never met another blind person. And it's kind of like finding a whole new world. Yeah. Even when I left blind rehab, because I knew, uh, like I said, my, my skills weren't anywhere near being independent in any of the things that, that they taught me. I asked them, I was like, so is there like a, an assisted living facility for like younger people who are blind? Because like, I don't want to go to a retirement home or something. And they're like, no, like you'll be able to get on your own. I didn't believe them. But it's so wild when you stop and have these conversations, you realize how much, <laughs> the, like, how much change can come over a short period of time and growth. It's it's really neat. I love hearing people's stories about it. Like you said, everyone's is is different, and yeah, regardless of how it happened, they still made that decision to overcome it. And I love that. Yeah, everyone's journey is so unique, and yet somewhere in there, there's something we can all take from. So it's great to hear those stories. Now, Zach, you took on another challenge and you're in the midst of writing your own book. When can we see that? And 
Well, let's talk about that. It's tough. I expect to be finished with the initial version of the manuscript here in about two months. I've been working on it for almost two months, and I just hit 37,000 words this morning. I'm guessing it'll finish somewhere around 60, and then that's where it kind of takes a fork in the road. The publishing process is very convoluted, and there's different routes you can take. And if I self-publish, then I, it'll be out before the end of the year. But if you end up getting a literary agent and going the traditional public, publishing route and uh, there's all sorts of complications between the two the way which is best for you and which route you should go but that's all up to the publisher at that point you know you find an editor and you work with an editor if you self-publish that you work with independently and so everything is dictated by your pace and so at the pace I've been going I know I would have it out by the end of the year whereas traditional publishing it can take they can put you on the backlog for two or three years if they want I don't know yet at this point I am investigating both avenues all of its very open to changes on the timeline and outside variables. Someone's interested in learning more about Swift or coding, what would you suggest to them? I have my website for my public speaking and, and my, my writing at zachtidwell.net, but in terms of the coding stuff, my company, Dark Horse Game Studios, has darkhorsegamestudios.com, and under the articles section, I've actually written a couple short articles outlining everything that I use to code on a daily basis and how I taught myself. I've got accessible resources listed and everything, all the same stuff that I've used. And so that would be the best place to go find that because there's it has all the links. I don't just have to tell you the information, then you have to go Google it. You can follow it just like I did. Now you had the Veterans Administration and you met up with some groups with uh, other people who are blind. If someone's looking to get involved in groups or, I mean, typically if they're a veteran, they would be informed of this stuff, but what would you suggest to someone who is looking for activities to do? So that's actually not even necessarily the case with veterans. Honestly, the biggest way that I've gotten connected with stuff is deciding something that I want to get into and Googling until I've found another blind person who's done it and I reach out. But if you want to get into the stuff that I get into in terms of like the skiing or the kayaking and stuff, if you Google adaptive sports center and whatever it is that you want to do there's odds are there, there's programs somewhere unless uh, driving right blind people aren't going to be driving until self-driving cars are out there but you know if it's cycling or swimming or road racing that should at least get you on the right track to find some places you might have to travel to them obviously you can't ski everywhere so organizations like that that have people specifically trained like for me to when i ski these people have certifications to guide blind skiers down the mountain mm -hmm. and so that those would be the places to go online i did ski for light i had a helmet with a speaker and microphone and my guide would stay right behind me and it was pretty cool i hadn't done it for 20 years and all of a sudden i'm out there in rapid city south dakota or north of there up at the leads 7200 feet up a little taller than denver yeah it was so invigorating that i was just thrilled to be able to do it again safely of course and i also joined blind hockey and the first time I took a guy down, by you know, there's no checking, but you can fight for the same real estate. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like inside my body, it was like, I'm competing. I'm active. And yes, I'm at the throttle. I choose this. I'm doing it. It's like, oh, you know, he got me back. But <laughs> <laughs> it's sports. And it's shocking how independent all that stuff is once you're there. So, you know, you probably noticed. And like for me, once you get me to the slope, it's on my own. They don't tell me when to make turns or anything. I can feel the pitch in the mountain. And unless I get too far to one side or someone falls down in front of us, it's all me. Same thing with kayaking. They get me to the rapids. And then once I'm in it, it's all feel. It's getting hit by waves and flipped over and then having to right the boat and getting yelled at to paddle, 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 paddle. <laughs> and that feeling though of, I mean, the fact that just, just being willing to do, to do that stuff is so big, but you get those independent moments. And I think people who haven't experienced those probably can't necessarily appreciate the value of those, but I'm, I'm sure you feel that with hockey too. Yeah. It's something that I did before I lost eyesight too, so that I'm revisiting. It's totally different. It's not the same, yeah. but if you haven't done anything like that for 15, 10, 15 years or five years even, and you're doing something you find a new a new high 
Yeah. It really changed my outlook on all these sports that people do. I appreciate anything they're doing, whether it's beatball or goalball. They're playing baseball. They're playing cricket. They're playing. There's a whole bunch of blind stuff out there. Yeah. <laughs> there's actually one in Colorado that's literally called the the Adaptive Sports Center. But typically, you know, there's adaptive sports centers are like a, like a category of, of organization, essentially. So, a Google search. Yeah get connected with that i'm looking for more of your creativity to hit the shelves should i say whether it's be in the app store or in the library or just the stories that you're going to be sharing with people because it seems like you have a lot of passions that you have yet to fill and you're taking the challenges to do them so thanks for coming on the blind abilities and thanks for doing what you're doing today yeah thank you thanks for having me on It's so great to meet Zach Tidwell and to learn more about his journey and understand more about his journey as well. If you want to learn more about Xanagrams, download it. Check it out on the App Store. If you want to learn more about Zach Tidwell and what he's up to, his book, his creations, check him out on the web at zachtidwell.net and at darkhorsegamestudios.com. And that's in the show notes as well. For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com, on Twitter at BlindAbilities, and download the free Blind Abilities app from the App Store and Google Play Store. That's two words, Blind Abilities. And if you want to leave some feedback, give us some suggestions, give us a call at 612-367-6093. We'd love to hear from you. I want to thank you for listening, and until next time, bye-bye. When we share what we see through each, each, other's, each other's eyes, eyes we, can we can then begin, begin to bridge, bridge the gap between, between the limited, limited expectations and, and the reality of blind abilities. And the realities of blind abilities. Of blind abilities. Of blind abilities.